These are in listen only mode. Welcome everyone to our PNSQC webinar with Rex Black today and uh, we're great uh, we're really happy to have Rex here today. Um, but first a few minutes uh, a few seconds on PNSQC. PNSQC is the oldest software quality conference in North America. I can't believe it's been around for 33 years um, and it's held annually in Portland, Oregon. What makes PNSQC unique is that it's a nonprofit organization all run by volunteers um, like myself. My name is Phil Liu and I'm the moderator today. Um, another unique thing about the PNSQC conference is that we invite practitioners from the field and they're not necessarily uh, polished speakers, but they're great at sharing their experiences and solving problems in their jobs. And that's what we like about our conference. It's more of a casual type conference where people come and share their ideas and there's all kinds of great networking. Um, so please join us this year in October in Portland, as usual, from October 17th to 19th. If you haven't registered already, there's still an opportunity to register uh, for a great discount for early bird discount. And um, so let me just go on and uh, introduce Rex here. Rex is the president of RBCS, and um, Rex is, doesn't really need much of an introduction. He's probably the most prolific author in terms of uh, software testing and software quality, software testing processes um, in the world, actually. Um, you know, if you pick up any book on software testing, it's most likely going to be um, by Rex Black. Um, so without further ado, I'll just let Rex do his thing. Rex, um, Rex is going to be at our keynote, our speaker, um, on the 18th, by the way. And he's going to be speaking about metric mistakes that people make and how you can avoid them and how you can kind of um, back up metrics uh, with economic theories and find ways that you can implement them in the real world. So um, let's see here if we can get Rex. Rex, are you there? I am here. Okay. All right. Thank you for the kind words, most of which were true. <laughs> <laughs> well, I try not to lie, so um, I'm going to. It's uh, easier to remember that way. That's right. <laughs> All right, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, change the presenter over to you, and um, let's see if we can get this going here. Um, shoot, let's see here. I'm, I'm ready to catch the football. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't see your name as a make presenter on here. Are you, are you, um, huh. oh, there you are. Okay. The panelist. Here we go. You ready? Aha. Yes. Okay. So, uh, can you guys see that? Yep. Uh, yeah, we can. Yeah. Thank you for it. I'll go, go into presenter mode here and then we'll be good to go. Okay. successfully mastered the technology I'll tell you uh, and it's appropriate because you know we now have done mobile presentation changing right you're in one place I'm somewhere else so you That's know right. you got that tie in there uh, yeah so uh, uh, today I'm going to talk about mobile testing obviously and um, some examples of uh, mobile computing and uh, mobile telephones from the 1960s uh, the uh, image on the left is about as mobile as computing has ever gotten. That is uh, one of the Apollo uh, guidance systems that went to the moon. Um, so that's about as, as far as uh, as far as, as humans have taken their computing with them. <laughs> of course, we've sent it sent it further unmanned, but uh, it's pretty mobile. And then you have the 1960s era mobile phone, uh, which is kind of hard to imagine how you would check your bank balance or use Yelp on that, isn't it? Um, so let's see. Uh, there we go. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so things have changed quite a bit since the 1960s. Um, you know, mo mobile computing, mobile phones were two very distinct and different things, and now they're the same um, in a lot of ways. They've merged. Um, and uh, with the mobile computing on the mobile phones have come, of course, the mobile apps, um, tens of thousands of them. 
um, and um, actually closer to millions of them at this point. And um, what we're seeing is something kind of interesting. I'm going to show you some stats on this a little later. Is that uh, people continue to use their PCs at an increasing rate, but the uh, mobile apps are have have overtaken them and uh, are growing at a at a much faster rate. Um, now, this is important to us as testers because while there are a lot of similarities in terms of how to test a mobile app, there are also some very important differences. So today I want to touch briefly on what stays the same and, and uh, spend a fair amount of time going through some of the differences that uh, you, you want to be aware of as you're testing. So in terms of things that are the same, um, definitely um, the, the main techniques and considerations remain uh, remain the same. So you know, there's, it's not like all of the uh, best practices of test design, black box and white box test design, experience based test design, defect based test design, those have not changed. Um, they're still there and as we go I'm going to talk about applying the specific test design techniques to specific problems and, um, and challenges associated with mobile testing. Uh, automation remains a big uh, concern uh, for mobile, especially for regression testing because of the, the rapid rate of change. And uh, the sort of universal testing problem now, um, which really has been a testing problem for quite a while, I think people are just more aware of it, is uh, data, test data management, test environment management. Um, so those, those remain um, the same and, and are not really affected on the uh, uh, by, by the, the move to mobile so much. Um, <laughs> sadly, there has not been any sort of magic quality wand that has uh, hit the uh, software world on the head. Um, and this is true in uh, mobile apps, as the same as any other kind of software. Um, there is no evidence that anything is, uh, the mobile apps are less buggy. Um, now, you might think, well, but they're simpler. Um, yeah, but. Uh, there also are some things like uh, people trying to get stuff out very quickly and so forth that push the, the needle in the wrong direction uh, in terms of, uh, of quality. Hey, um, so. Rex, we had a question that just came in about the test automation stuff. And the question, sure. is, the question is, you know, that test automation with mobile and especially regression testing, uh, test automation changes with different types of tools with the mobile platform. And so the, the question is kind of, why um, why would we want to do test automation because things are changing so fast and usually we do test automation for parts of the application that are relatively stable but with mobile apps things are moving around quite a bit well that is one of the big challenges is finding a way to approach this in a maintainable fashion and that's something I'm going to touch on a little bit later okay um, sort of the classic well so a, a dominant test automation paradigm over the last uh, 20 or so years has been automate through the graphical user interface, mm -hmm. um, which I don't think was ever a particularly great idea to begin with. And and with with rapid change of the um, interfaces on the mobile apps, it makes it even less of a good idea. So I'm going to throw out some other options that people should think about here in a, in a few minutes. Okay, great. Uh, and of course, you know, there's there's the server side too, right? Which is um, most many apps have a server side component, and then you're you're basically talking about testing through, uh, uh, you know, network visible APIs of one sort or another, or protocols of some kind. So anyway, well, I'll get into that a little bit more a little later. Um, Something else that's really important uh, and, and has stayed the same is that, that we should not just be thinking about functionality. Uh, certainly usability, performance, and reliability are as critical, if not even more critical, for uh, mobile apps. Um, and and uh, we need to think about those from a testing point of view. Um, there is a, a common testing mistake is to, uh, to silo on the functionality bit. Um, so we want to avoid that. Uh, safety critical and mission critical applications are showing up on mobile devices. So one of my clients uh, that I worked with last year, uh, they do uh, medical uh, facility management uh, like hospitals and urgent care clinics and doctor's offices and pharmacies and so forth. And there are 
apps that are used by pharmacists and doctors and physicians assistants and, and nurses and so forth to to, to make safety related decisions um, and to capture information that has uh, safety critical implications so uh, you know these these are, are applications that need to be tested in compliance with FDA regulations um, so you know it's uh, uh, important to say well you know regardless of the platform these things deserve the same kind of attention that they would get um, in any other um, any other platform and of course the other thing that stays the same is that uh, you can expect that uh, the tools will be constantly evolving the technology is changing very rapidly and so skills growth and staying current is is going to be important so those are the things that are the same now there are a number of things that uh, are, are different, and I've listed some of them here. I don't, um, in spite of the fact that this is a fairly long list, I don't have any illusions that this is a, a, a comprehensive list. Um, it's just uh, some of the things that uh, I think are, are uh, very prevalent and, and very likely to affect uh, most people involved in testing mobile apps. So let's take a look at each one of these areas here in a little more detail. Um, so one of the ones that's it's pretty obvious is that that you many times you have uh, mobile apps that are designed to uh, use sensors to gather um, information or uh, uh, to uh, to accept inputs of of one kind or another. Um, and this can be direct or it can be indirect. So um, you know you could have a health uh, monitoring application that's monitoring heart rate, um, but um, you know the, the the way that it displays can depend on whether the the screen is held straight up and down or or in a landscape mode. Um, and then you also have the uh, uh, possibility of external peripherals that. Uh, are used to uh, output information or input information. So Bluetooth keyboards, for example, HDMI screens. Um, so those are uh, additional considerations. So from a testing point of view, certainly you want to make sure that you have identified all of the sensors and peripherals that can be involved uh, in, in uh, used by your app, both directly and indirectly. Um, now that is likely to be, in many cases, a very large number, especially if you support multiple devices. So, for example, if you're running on Android and you're going to support uh, most of the different Android devices, that's uh, going to be a very, very big number. So, equivalence partitioning and boundary value analysis will come in handy here to try to identify a more reasonable set of configurations. And if that set of configurations is still not reasonable because there's still just too darn many of them, then you probably want to use some sort of risk analysis and uh, looking at you know what could go wrong with the different configurations and how many of our customers will act how bad would the, the problems be now in some cases apps don't depend on connectivity uh, at least to work though of course the app got onto the phone somehow or the other mobile device tablet etc it got there somehow and often cases this is through connectivity and of course there are frequent updates which involves connectivity so um, to a, even to an um, app that doesn't function via uh, connectivity there's the update issue so connectivity is, is uh, likely to be a concern especially if your app does use connectivity uh, during its, its regular operations and of course, you've got different kinds of connectivity. So are we talking about Wi-Fi data versus mobile data? Uh, are there data restrictions that can come up? So for example, uh, I do a fair amount of international travel and checking when I'm outside the country while I have my phone on uh, and I'm available for, for phone calls, I have data uh, turned off. Um, so you know your app needs to be able to understand that while there may be a connection there's no data and it needs to handle that in a, in a, uh, a graceful fashion and of course Wi-Fi you know it's not like the entire uh, world is blanketed with uniform powerful fast Wi-Fi connectivity um, we keep talking about that and, and that keeps not yet happening um, so 
you know that can can vary uh, the amount of Wi-Fi bandwidth available to you. Um, and connectivity is a uh, dynamic thing, so it's not like oh okay I'm in this place and I've got this connection and now that's not going to change for the entire time that the app is in use. In fact, you know it's quite likely that the connectivity will change, and in some cases when the app is in the middle of doing something. Hey, so, Rex, we did have a question that just came in on the uh, connectivity issues. They're wondering, how do you test different types of connectivity? Like, how would you test 3G versus 4G versus, you know, the edge network uh, without actually going there and trying it? Well, <laughs> either you're going to have some very, very expensive equipment in your test lab, which you probably aren't because it's really expensive to try to do that right. or you actually do have to get out and test your app in motion mm -hmm. uh, just sitting around in a test lab with uh, with your devices and and testing there I mean you can you can diddle with the Wi-Fi and you can simulate various kinds of things by diddling with the settings of your phone right but you know the signal strength that you have is going to be the signal strength that you have and you know the tower that you're connected to is going to be the tower that you're connected to and it's a certain distance away and you know now there there are some things you can do to try to attenuate signals that are not uh, as expensive um, for example uh, having uh, Faraday cages available to you which is just basically metal boxes of various yeah. kinds mm -hmm. uh, but um, you know, there's, there's not going to be a whole lot of substitute for getting out there and moving around when you're trying to test for what happens when we have connectivity mm -hmm. uh, issues. Right. So um, certainly you want to use various kinds of techniques to identify the different conditions that affect connectivity and make sure that you covered those. Those would be things that you could model with decision tables. Um, use cases can be helpful here of uh, um, identifying the different exceptions that could occur when connectivity changes happen. Um, State-based modeling as well. So you you have your your different connection states and you know what's supposed to happen if a certain event occurs in a particular state. And um, if there are certain kinds of transactions that are dependent on certain kinds of uh, connections or will change based on certain kinds of connections you might want to use some pairwise techniques uh, to uh, make sure that you've you've looked at those different ways that um, that those interactions can occur and as I said if, if an app is meant to be used in motion then you know it should be tested in motion um, just sitting around in a in a fixed location like a test lab and assuming that that's going to give you adequate coverage of your connectivity change issues is uh, um, you know not likely to work out mm -hmm. uh, which brings us to radios because uh, a lot of this this connectivity is done through uh, through radios of one form or another um, so you've got the the cellular network you've got Wi-Fi you've got Bluetooth you've got the uh, near field communication which is basically a specialized form of RFID or radio frequency identification uh, and there might be others in a particular device uh, and uh, radios and radio signals are they're weird uh, I mean there's there's of course the the issue of, of str signal strength variation um, which is sort of counterintuitive if you're used to dealing with PC apps so you know with with software we're used to dealing with a digital world and things are either on or off um, and of course you know that's not what's really happening inside the PC you've got signals and but that's the the model is is digital and and um, you know so that's sort of the expected behavior well you know radios don't don't behave that way um, so you do have issues with the strength varying uh, uh, Faraday cages as I said which is just basically a uh, how electromagnetic waves move uh, across metal surfaces so they can uh, deflect you see an image here of this, this guy, Dr. Megavolt, who's a sort of traveling performer. He's being hit by, uh, you know, thousands of volts from a Tesla coil. That's that thing that's on the left. Um, why is that not causing him distress? Well, because what's wrapped around his head, where that's hitting him, is a Faraday cage. 
which if it looks a lot like a bird cage, it's because it probably is. <laughs> but effectively, what happens is that deflects all of the the um, electric current. Um, so the same kind of thing can happen. So if you get in an elevator, you probably notice, hey, what happened to my cell signal? Well, that's a Faraday cage. Our house has a metal roof on it, and our office also has a metal roof on it. So our cell signal is not very good, uh, especially if you get into the middle of the house. Um, there are, you know, line of sight issues that can come up. Um, that uh, you know, if you're not, if, if you can't draw a straight line without obstructions of certain kinds, anyway, from your device to the transmitter receiver, then um, you might not get a signal. Though you might. So there's this what's called Rayleigh and uh, Rissian fading that that happens. So if you've ever walked around in New York City or another similarly built up uh, area with your cell phone, you've noticed, man, this, is, this signal is really weird. Um, that's the, basically all sorts of ref reflections uh, and, and dead spots that are happening because of that. Um, and of course, there's just limitations on how far signals can travel. Some, some of this is, is by design and on purpose, in a sense, or exploited, if you will. Like, for example, with the uh, NFC, the, 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 one of the uh, ways that it's supposedly kept uh, secure is this sort of security by obscurity. It basically it, it only transmits a certain distance. Um, so, you know, they can't, uh, it's not like uh, Wi-Fi where it can be snooped by people who are nearby, which is why it's used as the uh, vehicle for things like Google Pay. Um, so certainly if you, you know, your testing apps and uh, the apps are almost certainly going to be using radios for input or output, so spend some time studying this. Um, and again, you know, think about in motion uh, situations, especially if the app is designed to be used in motion. So if you're doing a, a navigation app, for example, and obviously it's going to be moving, so that's something that you need to think about. And um, there are different personas here. You know, obviously there's the person walking, the person driving, the person on a bus, the person on a train, subway. You know, so those would be uh, things to test. Hey, hey, Rex. Uh, regarding yeah. these different radio radios i would say that bluetooth is probably you know one of the most predominant that's that's coming up uh, in terms of mobile devices connecting to different other things and i was wondering if you had any insights or recommendations on on testing bluetooth stuff um it seems to me that you know this just in my own personal life and connecting my mobile phone to my garmin watch and a bunch of other things there's always glitches it just never works very well yeah, it, yeah. It, sometimes it works and and sometimes it doesn't. And it's yeah, it's, like I got this thing that allows me to use my my phone on my stereo. It's it basically it's a Bluetooth adapter that connects to the audio inputs on the stereo and and uh, pairs up to the the phone or other mobile device. Worked right away. Uh, I had yeah. no problems with it, but. Yeah, I've had other other things where it's just like almost impossible to figure out well, why doesn't it talk to that. Uh, in some cases, that's on purpose. Like the Windows phones don't support uh, Bluetooth keyboards, and that's apparently by design, though you, it's impossible to find out why. Um, so yeah, there can be. I mean, just just any kinds of, uh, of of these kinds of establishing connections can be really fraught. So you, you want to. Um, you know, going back to something I was talking about earlier with the, the whole peripherals, you know, I use um, uh, equivalence partitioning and boundary value analysis to try to identify um, the, the the different things that you should test. Right. Um, you know, and, it, and if they're more central to the use of your app, then obviously it's more important to test them. But, yeah, yeah there's just so much of it out there, you know, that it's... Um, <laughs> You, you, as as a consumer, it's maddening, right? As a tester, it's also equally frustrating in the sense of, you know, you do not have the time or the budget to test everything, so you have to make really smart choices and accept that certain things just are not going to work. Well, either not, or, you know, not work not reliably. Work. reliably. I mean, we're we're testing Bluetooth um, equipment, and so I think the you know the equivalence partitioning and the um, pairwise testing is 
pretty helpful way to cut down on the configurations because when you think about it, when you're testing a Bluetooth device, the distance that you're going is, um, you have to break that down into reasonable things like, you know, say less than five feet, five to 10, yeah. 10 to 20 feet. Otherwise you just go crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That's yes. I mean, there's, so there's the equivalence partitioning and, and pairwise testing to identify the, the configurations. And then as you point out, there's the, the um, use cases that have to be examined here and it can be helpful to try to, to use various personas for that. Like, you know, this, this thing I was talking about that attaches to my stereo, um, I can have my phone a good 25 feet away from it. Um, and as long as it's line of sight, um, it, it works fine. Uh, but I have a headphone that I use and, um, while it's like maybe three feet away from the phone, uh, I have all sorts of issues with with like staticky kind of stuff happening with it, where I'll be listening to a podcast and it'll like it'll it'll click and then stop and then restart. I can't figure out what the heck is going on. But you know, obviously the the headset is a whole lot closer. Uh, right. But maybe you know the fact that the the headset is in motion relative to the phone really screws things up. I I don't know. Yeah. So careful design of your tests and. and Again, considering these different use cases is really important because if if you don't test the different ways that things are actually going to get used, you're you're likely to miss stuff. Yeah, and sitting at your desk is not probably not. Uh, it could be a test case, but not not a prevalent one. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, if you know if you're creating a a, a podcast app or a music app. Uh, I mean, you just know that people are going to be using those while they're on their, uh, you know, ride to work on a bus or subway, or they're, uh, you know, at the gym and they're working out. And and you know, if you if all you're doing is testing sitting in a lab with that, that's just not, you know, even remotely a realistic simulation of of how it's going to be used. So, you know, expect that you're not going to find things and that you're going to have. You know, irritated customers and one-star reviews and app stores and those sort of things because you miss stuff. And then, of course, you've got, you know, your key, key stakeholders coming back to you going, why didn't you test for that? Right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so people making that transition from, you know, they're used to testing PC apps, uh, that's not, you know, that that's just not going to occur to you, right? I mean, you test a PC app by sitting in front of the thing and, and testing it, right? And you know, doesn't matter that it's moving around. And even even though PC connectivity is often, you know, an issue with, say, Wi-Fi or something like that, once you fire the thing up, you're at a fixed location with respect to the Wi-Fi radio, you know, right. which isn't going to be the case with a with a mobile device under most, under many, any many circumstances. Right. Okay. And it's the radios, as I said, that make that weird, you know. Um, it's just that the radios radios are weird if if you what you're used to is digital testing digital software uh, radios will behave in ways that will be very perplexing right okay that's good um, now another thing and and this is this is not fundamentally different than PC apps but it's sort of this you know like the spinal tap joke about you know our amps go to 11. It's like with with connectivity uh, between um, apps and and with the app and other other services is is just it's it's amazing with respect to PCs and this is where you know people will get confused is uh, you think about a word processor a typical word processor on a PC like like Microsoft Word you know to the extent that it's going to be interacting with anything else it's it's usually just through copy and paste of text. Right. Uh, of course, it, it interacts with a printer, but you know, I mean, then we're talking about uh, operating system-based printer drivers, and that's technology that's been around forever. You know, um, so you know, it's fairly straightforward, limited. Um, even email, you know, which is which, of course, relies on connectivity. You have these very well-defined SMTP and POP interfaces, and and that's all it does, right? But if you think about mobile apps, um, apps share data with each other, um, 
apps are, are interoperating with the operating system and with the device capabilities, which of course are intermediated by the operating system, but nonetheless you have to understand you know, the sensors, the cameras, etc. Um, assuming that there is a server-side piece or that your app uses stuff that's out on the internet, there's services and protocols that are being uh, interacted with there, and then of course you've got the, the whole you know uh, interaction remote interaction via radios of one kind or another or some other non radio transmitter receiver like a like infrared um, and so this is something you definitely need to look at is what are all of the interfaces and all the ways that your app can interoperate both from the send side and receive side both passive and active and also requests and responses uh, because if you forget those, then any any one of those, then there's something that's likely to not work. And again, of course, this has an intersection with the, some of the things that I've been talking about before with respect to radios and connectivities and so forth. So you want to look at equivalence partitioning and boundary value analysis there. Uh, so and, and possibly even state state based types of um, uh, modeling. And then for any any sort of incoming interface, um, fuzzing is going to be a good idea. Just use boundary value analysis and equivalence partitioning and identify the invalids and go, okay, well, we we sent invalid stuff into this interface based on, you know, these these fairly well-established and certainly helpful models like equivalence partitioning and boundary value analysis. But you also want to just test just random noise, right? So the fuzzing or or sometimes referred to as, as fault injection, though it's, fault injection is really not the right name, but basically sending corrupt random streams of input into your interfaces to just make sure that nothing untoward happens. Now, of course, if you if you do manage to provoke anything like a buffer overflow, you know you you know that you've got some weaknesses, security weaknesses there. Um, and you know, of course, if you have, if there are security issues associated with your app, so for example, the the client, my client that uses medical uh, apps on their mobile devices, um, you want to actually have an organized penetration test against all of those different interfaces to see if it's possible to get the app to violate security. Now, uh, lithium. Um, so 30 years ago, uh, if you had any knowledge of lithium, um, it was because you had clinical depression or somebody you were related to had clinical depression, and that's what lithium was used for, uh, pretty much. I mean, this is common use. Um, but now lithium is everywhere. Everybody has lithium, um, and lithium still has a connection to people's depression in the sense that it, it's uh, if people's batteries die, then they get depressed. And, or they get agitated. Uh, my my daughter is a sure sure way to get either of them riled up is you know put them in a situation where their their mobile device is at five percent and they don't have a charger um, and that's just you know <laughs> the, the real amount of chaos will ensue um, and so batteries like radios are are weird uh, you know I mean they're chemical they're they're not you know, not digital. They're they're analog, um, and they're affected by heat. And then you have software that's trying to manage the power as well, um, and that affects the the behavior of of apps in some cases directly or indirectly. So you want to make sure that you've identified different kinds of power and power management scenarios, and you've tested with those, especially if you have. Uh, enabling or disabling of features that happens under certain types of uh, uh, power management scenarios um, you know check to see what happens if the if you go from say power management kicks in at 19 percent you go from 20 percent to 19 percent what if that happens like right in the middle of some operation so using decision tables use cases and state-based tests of various kinds can be good ways of of making sure you don't miss any of these important events and condition combinations. And of course, if you are going to be using your app outside, if it's designed to be used outside or in a vehicle, like on a dashboard of a vehicle when it's you know a navigation app, uh, make sure that you think about temperature. Again, just sitting in a nice air-conditioned office that's at a constant temperature is not going to be a realistic model 
of, uh, of what's actually going to happen. And, and, and yes, indeed, the battery is going to behave differently. Um, and heat, heat dissipation is a real issue with, with this because um, you don't have available to you the kind of uh, heat dissipation options that you have with a PC. You can't just put a fan in a mobile device, for example. Um, so another interesting platform difference here, above and beyond this whole battery heat power management thing, uh, relative to to PCs, is your CPU memory and storage capabilities. Uh, you know, people sometimes make the mistake of of looking at the clock rate on their CPU and going, "Oh, well, the clock rates are about the same in a certain number of megahertz and so forth," but um, that that really doesn't have anything to do with it. Um, it's it you know you got you have to look at at the the actual power of the CPU, what not power like uh, electrical power. I mean computing power. So I just did a quick check while I was putting this presentation together on my let's, what I'm a three or four year old uh, Panasonic uh, CF fifty three Toughbook um, relative to my one year old LG. Uh, for phone um, and my my PC has two times the CPU power. Uh, now you might say, ah, well, you know, this is all transient. You know, Moore's law is going to catch up here. Well, mm, you know, not not until you get around the power and the heat issues. And and uh, you know, Moore's law applies specifically to transistor density on integrated circuits. It, it does not change the nature of uh, you know the the three fundamental laws of thermodynamics, which is what you have going against you with respect to power and heat issues that we discussed a minute ago, plus the issues of battery chemistry, those aren't going to go away. Um, so it, to make this worse, that when you get into a power management mode, that's going to tend to even reduce your CPU performance further. So um, again, you know, don't. Think think realism here for for your testing on device side performance and reliability um, when you're testing a native app or a hybrid app that's you know not not one that's running on a browser. Uh, you need to think about well what other stuff is going to be going on on the um, mobile device at the time, and how does power management and heat affect this? If you've got a app that uh, is um, you know not going to behave well when it's under resourced from a CPU or memory perspective you're setting yourself up for for lots of performance and reliability problems so I guess with uh, multiple active apps you probably have uh -huh. with multiple active apps you probably have to think about the, the user groups that you're that are going to be using your app um, I would think that right. uh, if you have an app that's targeted towards um, Millennials, for instance, then you might uh, always test the app with all the apps that they might be using. You know, Facebook and WhatsApp and all these other things active at the same time. Yeah, Instagram and Snapchat mm. and all that kind of stuff, right? Right. Mm. Yeah, it's very important that you do that kind of user persona modeling and and uh, set up your background loads appropriate to the different user personas, right? I mean. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the the professional, the the student, uh, millennial, uh, senior, you know, whatever your your demographics look like, make sure that you understand them and understand what apps they use, and make sure that those are running in the background. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so yep, yeah, it's it's complicated, and um, but if you just if you don't take this into account, you'll have you'll generate very misleading performance and reliability results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would imagine Which, that the results would be much different for a, like a senior versus a millennial. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, certainly your transaction mix would be sure. different. And then you've got the, you know, savvy versus non-savvy user too, right? I mean, a technical person like you or me, phone starts behaving oddly, things get slow, might immediately go, hmm, I wonder if there's some background stuff I can kill. Right. Whereas somebody else would be like, oh, I don't know, you know. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, not only the multiple active apps, but also you got to think about the intersection between that and power management and heat stress and so forth, because that's going to 
going to further uh, degrade resource availability. Right. Okay. Um, now, some some folks involved in app testing may feel like this poor bugger here is getting hit by a water cannon. Uh, I mean, it's just constant updates. Um, and a mixed metaphors here, if you can, if you prefer, it's there's just sort of this hamster wheel effect of you know the faster you go, the faster you have to go because there's all these competitive pressures, uh, and this this is the case that even if your app is not constantly changing, there are all these interoperating apps that out there that your app might be talking to, and those could be changing, and that could then affect. The way that your app behaves, so this gets you to the need for the automated regression test. Now, the GUI, graphical user interface, is not your friend here because it's you know all these updates mean that it's changing. So you want to look at you know where can I create maintainable regression tests? Um, you know, do you have options like application program interfaces, web services, uh, command lines, data? Um, repositories of one kind or another. I mean, think of alternate ways of getting at the uh, um, getting getting at the app and its capabilities rather than just through the GUI. So, for example, there's this lightweight scripting language called TCL or Tickle, which is um, available for Androids and can and can be used to put a command line on an app, even if your app doesn't have a native command line. So. You know that's that's one way of, of doing it. Like try try to expose as much of the business logic through some other interface and be able to test through that other interface. Uh, except that you're not going to get to a hundred percent. So the perfect is the enemy of the good. You know of of something something simple that gets you a significant amount of regression risk reduction is is preferable to something. Uh, really complex that that takes forever to build and that might be broken in a year by the changes. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, you look at things like using simulators, using outsourced testing labs, using crowdsourcing. Those are other ways of of trying to uh, to deal with this uh, so-called A/B testing uh, to do some of the testing in production. So you know, just. You, you want to you want to back away from the whole concept of oh I have regression risk therefore I'm going to create a bunch of automated re uh, functional regression tests that run through the GUI, which has just been like the you know hit the the rubber mallet to the kneecap knee jerk reaction that people have had for for quite a while you know since the 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 90s which I think is just basically. A, Regression test automation through the GUI starting in the 90s to me was like you know a big wrong turn, um, and I think we're you know, hopefully coming back to uh, people thinking about all the different options that you have available to do it. Um, <clears throat> your app might be one that um, interacts with and is interrupted by the uh, big wide world out there. Um, so of course social media. Obviously, you know, one of the things that, you know, Facebook is wanting to get you to do is to spend more time looking at Facebook so that they can expose you to more advertisements, right? So they're going to be constantly hitting you with some interruptions of some kind or another. So there's that, you know, weather updates, weather alerts, amber alerts, and my phone goes off on those uh, once a week or so, it seems like. Of course, text messages can come in, phone calls can come in if you've got navigational software running in the background um, or, or in the foreground that can be uh, can can have interrupt uh, interruptions and and these interruptions even if if your app isn't being hit by the interruption if the interruption happens it can interrupt what your app is doing so you can't assume that you your app has total control of, of the system and its resources at any point without and, and is not subject to interruption um, so you want to look at the state-based modeling here, different kinds of use cases, decision tables to model the way that conditions can inter uh, interact with each other. Of course, equivalence partitioning is necessary to identify the different interruptions that can occur. 
and you also need to think about the connectivity and power management stuff so pairwise uh, testing of these interactions and interruptions with different connectivity conditions and power management conditions is something also to consider if you're um, you know subject to uh, to these kinds of interruptions coming in and a final thing to note on the interruptions is if you look at this uh, figure here you'll see that it's the weather okay so that's obviously the weather is subject to regular updates but the way they fund themselves is by serving you ads which I redacted the ad here because why give them free advertising but that's another form of, of interruption that's that's happening is, is you know ads getting pushed down so old school real old school this believe it or not I this is what I learned to type on <laughs> I kid you not I had a Remington Rand typewriter in my uh, house um, I, I learned to type on this beast and then uh, took the, the most valuable class I ever took in high school my typing class so for years this has really been it you know um, and then you know there was like the, the the massive amazement of the GUI and the mouse and like oh my god you know but if you think about the, the 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 change from you know a character based type of interface like um, you know the old green screen 32 IBM 3270s uh, some of you might know what I'm talking about here um, or or CPM or something like that to GUI um, you know this is the the change to mobile interfaces has been even more dramatic uh, so you know this poking and spreading and pinching and swiping and so forth is really uh, you know completely different so when you're doing your input validation testing yes use equivalence partitions and boundary values but you also need to look at equivalence partitioning of the different ways that inputs can occur to begin with um, and of course inputs you can be in the middle of an input when an interruption occurs which can lead to some interesting things happening like you've got a you know the soft keyboard is up and a phone call comes in for example so think about the interruptions and then you know uh, obviously think about usability I've seen a number of situations where the soft keyboard pops up and covers some or all of the fields that I'm trying to fill in with it which is not uh, particularly helpful <laughs> so um, here's that graph that I um, that I mentioned at the at the outset of the presentation that shows the the light green sort of sea green there that's the uh, number of hours per day uh, adult users spend with uh, uh, mobile devices um, and then the, the blue is uh, desktop and laptop so you can see that that is desktop and laptop has has increased continues to increase though you know it's it's sort of stabilizing um, whereas mobile has just like exploded um, and so it's it's a it's a you know greater percentage of time being spent um, and if you look at the number of hours total this is on a per user basis but then the number of users is growing right so if you look at the total number of hours spent on mobile apps it's following an exponential rate of growth um, so if you, you remember your college calculus the uh, second derivative of an exponential function is an exponential function so the rate of change of the rate of change. So remember the first derivative is the rate of change and the second derivative is the rate of change of the rate of change. So the rate of change of the change is increasing. Is that, that's what this is a fancy way of saying. So you're just getting it's just this explosion in terms of all the different apps that are out there uh, both within a single space and then in new spaces um, and, and so you know, expect the unexpected, as the cliche goes. That this, this, um, you know, continual change of the rate of change itself, in a in a positive direction, is um, gonna gonna lead you to some interesting uh, uh, encounters. 
Okay, so as as you've seen, hopefully as we went along here, you've noticed, you know, wow, okay, the same the same basic test design techniques that I use for PC apps are coming up again here: state-based testing, pairwise testing, decision tables, equivalence partitioning, boundary values. They're being applied to um, uh, different situations um, based on you know these mobile-specific types of considerations that are out there. Uh, so your your fundamental tool set is much uh, is very similar with PCs, but what you're trying to do um, is uh, um, different and uh, in in many ways more more complicated. There's more uh, dimensions of testing um, than a than a similar PC app, just in terms of all of the different considerations that uh, uh, that I ran through. And then, as I said, you know, expect continuous and disruptive changes um, that that will be coming along. You know, the exponential exponential change is something that humans have a really big challenge getting their their head around. There's, in fact, there's a uh, book by a guy named uh, Dietrich Derner, I think his name is, called "The Logic of Failure," and uh, he's talking specifically about people's failure to understand things and uh, a goodly portion of that book talks about the difficulty of understanding um, nonlinear and especially exponential changes. Uh, this is uh, one of the things that contributed to the Chernobyl disaster was when nuclear reactions follow an exponential um, curve um, so it's really not a good idea to just do little unauthorized experiments with fuel rods to see what happens because what happens is your reactor blows up um, and it goes from stable to exploding in a very, very fast period of time because change is exponential. So keep that in mind that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it might, might not be like standing in the middle of an unstable nuclear reactor uh, literally but uh, you know, certainly things are things are blowing up very quickly. So, uh, be looking for ways to to constantly extend testing best practices. Don't just apply them in a static sort of mode. Yeah, I think I think uh, Rex. One of the big takeaways for me is that um, there's just so many other aspects of of mobile testing. You brought up, you know, in terms of the different um, configurations and so forth, and really understanding how to reduce those logically and still get as much coverage as you can via the equivalence partitioning and the techniques like pairwise testing is really important. Yeah, that is certainly one of the one of the massive challenges is just, you know, all of these different dimensions including the configurations, the configuration variables, how to how to whittle that down into some sort of manageable size, um, right. because otherwise you're just you know, you're just going to be wandering around in the the big infinite cloud of tests that you could run. You know, you yeah. never get done. Mm -hmm. So I see that your your Twitter handle is uh, like a test dog. I was wondering how do dogs handle um, exponential functions? <laughs> Well, unfortunately, Leica is not available to explain. Um, but uh, I, dogs, uh, dogs, if anything, might actually be better at it because I think they just sort of play the hand they're dealt, and they don't they don't go into things with a whole lot of expectations. Uh, they're also very good at living in the moment. So <laughs> people, uh, you know, not so not so uh, flexible. Right. Right. <laughs> Well, Rex, it's been great. We really appreciate you having you here on our webinar and um, and sharing your knowledge on mobile testing and all the different consider considerations. You know, I've certainly uh, learned quite a bit here just in an hour, and um, we look forward to having you, um, you know, speak at our conference. I think what is the name of your talk is about metrics. Can you give us a little yep. uh, little um, tidbit of what's to come in your in your keynote? Sure, absolutely. So um, it's called uh, "Stupid Metric Tricks and How to Avoid Them," mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's looking at ways that uh, uh, organizations and managers misuse metrics and uh, and how to to avoid uh, making them. I'm actually, going to include a uh, both hopefully fun and and interesting, enlightening, uh, hands-on 
element to this where we're going to run uh, Deming's famous red bead experiment mm -hmm. uh, so that people can see firsthand a, uh, a classic uh, example of, uh, of misuse of metrics. Um, and it's not, I know that some people um, like to be anti metrics, and I'm not by any means anti metrics, I'm just anti stupid metrics. Uh, right. So. <laughs> uh, what I want to be trying to do is give people some insights into uh, where the where the the rocky shoals are and how to avoid running aground on them. Sure, and you're also going to be doing a one day uh, workshop as well, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, we've got a, a workshop on metrics where uh, we're actually going to go through and talk about different types of uh, testing related metrics, mm -hmm. and actually have people develop. Uh, metrics in the class, which will they'll then present and discuss with the other attendees. So it's going to be a real interactive uh, uh, type of, of event, um, which I've I've done similar kinds of workshops around the world, and, and uh, you know it's it's always interesting to get that kind of uh, you know let's let's not just talk about how to solve problems, let's actually solve problems and discuss solutions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, great. We'll look forward to seeing you in uh, October at the conference, Rex. And if anyone, yep. I forgot to mention that we did record the webinar and we are going to post it on our YouTube channel and uh, follow us along and we'll see you in October. So thanks very much, Rex, and we'll see you soon. All right. Thanks, Bill. All righty.